We're here today in London for our Why series, asking the question, why religion? Is all religion bad? Is religion irrational, immoral? Is it sexist? Is it racist and anti-gay and unloving? And is all religion dangerous? My son's facing a lot of difficult conversations with his friends, also for myself. It seems like people feel like they've already understood Christianity and dismissed it, when I feel like they, they actually really have it. You know, women were sidelined. They were told they weren't really worthy of, of being taught. What do we see? Jesus holding Mary up as an example when Martha says, you know, she should get back in the kitchen. Jesus says, no, she has chosen what is better. So if you ever wondered where that line, the woman's place is in the kitchen, you can be sure it's not from the Bible. The way that it was presented um, would make anyone think, an atheist, an agnostic, uh, anyone. Um, so I think it was, yeah, I think it was brilliant. Good morning everyone, it is a privilege to be here today, thank you Tanya. I'm going to be looking at this in the second session at this question of morality and religion and particularly looking at the question, is the Bible racist and sexist? And I think at the heart of this question is a question about the heart of the God of the Bible. So it's a profoundly deep question that runs right into the question of our identity and our value. Recently, I've just been aware of how topical this is in the last, um, in the kind of current uh, political sphere, what we've seen sweeping uh, the media have been uh, campaigns like Black Lives Matter, um, feminist marches all over in different cities, and of course the refugee crisis. And all of these questions in the political sphere are asking, how do we value human life? And what do we do when human lives are being devalued? What is the basis for the value of human life? As I've been preparing this talk, I've been conscious that in my own life, these particular questions of racism and sexism have been really fundamental. Um, as a woman, I feel like I've experienced on different levels uh, sexist discrimination and have sometimes felt part of a, a body of, of people who, as I look back over the centuries, have been oppressed in various ways. But as you may have also um, did, uh, picked up in my accent, I'm from uh, the uh, Antipodean regions of the, the southern parts of the world. I'm from South Africa. And as a white South African, this question has loomed large in my life, the question of racial oppression. And in that sense, I've been part of a body of people that have oppressed other people for centuries. And I've experienced feelings of great anger towards people who have seemed blind to systemic sexism. And then I've experienced great feelings of fear at my own blindness to systemic racism and how other people might perceive me and perhaps what my role has been in that. These are such emotionally charged issues because they really do cut to the core of our identity. As I've been preparing for this talk um, and reading up on more and more cases of sexism and racism, I have to say it's affected me greatly. I was quite shaken the more I read about almost the structures of our world. And the Bible uses the language principalities and powers, that there are structures that oppress and if we look across, across history, my, my academic background is in history. The study of history is the study of oppression and war. This is what humanity does to one another. We grab power, we take power, and we hurt and we abuse. I don't know if you recently saw a, um, Netflix brought out this... Um, this documentary about how at the end of slavery, we think what a wonderful, um, you know, great uh, moment for human history. We, we finally abolished the slave trade. But what happens? We see mass incarceration, and there have been now proven links between sort of easy sentences for, um, for people en masse just to supply another economic, you know, way of making money from people. And I've, as I watch that, just my heart breaking century after century, and the, just the effect that this has on us and on our humanity. How do we even begin to communicate with each other on these? It seems that walls of hostility are, against, are, are between us. I've sometimes felt that with men as a woman. I've sometimes wondered if when my anger is really aroused and I, I just I feel like, how can this ever be demolished? 
Richard Dawkins, um, in his book, The God Delusion, just like Simon was saying, he puts this at the door of the God of the Bible, at Yahweh. And he gives uh, Yahweh a couple of not so nice names, uh, which include unforgiving control freak, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, misogynistic, racist, malevolent bully. Um, I've certainly seen the Bible being used effectively to both encourage sexism and to maintain racist regimes. But of course, we all know that people's words can be twisted. Anyone can, you know, pl pluck a sentence out of the media, twist it, and turn around. That's obvious, we know that. So the question really is then, what is the overarching message of the Bible on this issue? And what is the heart of the God of the Bible on this issue? And I have become convinced that on both of these accounts, racism and sexism, the Bible is unequivocal. I wasn't always convinced, but I now am. And I hope that if you've come here today and this is a question that you have not got settled in your heart, I hope you know firstly that we even do these series because we believe that God takes our questions seriously. And the fact that you even have the impetus to ask this question is a gift from him. So if, you, if this is a challenge for you personally, can I encourage you to perhaps, as I'm speaking, maybe unshackle your heart a little bit, hold it out before God, and ask him to speak to you on this topic. If you have a sense of perhaps a fear that maybe deep down you hold some prejudiced views towards others, can I just say all of us do? and can encourage you to do the same thing. And if today you're not sure about what you believe about God, I hope that as I speak, as I paint a picture of what the God of the Bible is like, you will become clearer on who this God is and why it is you might wanna know him. So why am I convinced that the Bible is unequivocal on this issue? Well, actually, I believe that it's more than that. I believe it's actually the foundation that we have. It provides a foundation for us to claim that it is objectively true that all human lives are of equal value. So in order, in the short amount of time that I have, in order to do this, I wanna do two things. I wanna zoom out, I wanna look at the overarching message of the Bible, and then I wanna zoom in and look at a couple of specific examples. It's a short amount of time, so get your questions ready on pigeonhole. But to zoom out, this is what I wanna do. I wanna look at the overarching message, starting at Genesis, because what we're told in the Bible is that when God created the world, he had a perfect plan in mind, a beautiful world where there was no, um, no sin had yet entered. So what that gives us is a picture of what the kinds of, value, of God's values. Then we're told something goes wrong, free will is given as an option, and the consequent moral decisions that are the fallout of that mean that values which are not God's, which are at odds with the heart of the Bible, they enter the world. Now, if you can just bear with me for a moment, what I wanna say is that in that scenario, it becomes, the, the waters become muddied. We're already told that there are values that are at odds with God's world. And what, I mean, what, what that means for us is that when we look at the Bible in that sphere, we have to understand that already things are not God's ideal. God intervenes and God gets involved, but we are told that the law that he, in, that he inputs in that moment is temporary. And so when we're looking at that part of the Bible, we have to understand that is not God's ideal. When we wanna see God's ideal, again, from Genesis, we can jump through to the picture of what we're given at, in Revelation about the end of time. Again, this is a place we can see and be clear on God's ideals because this is where God is gonna restore all things, where, all, where the world is gonna be put right again, where the world will be healed. And so my argument is if we look both at Genesis before the fall and at the redeemed world, what we're gonna see is a beautiful um, picture of God's values. So what does Genesis say? Well, firstly, it says this in Genesis 1, 26. Sorry. That God, oh, I've lost my place, I'm so sorry. Oh, there's page three, sorry. <laughs> that God created man and woman in his image together. 
Male and female, he created them. What does it mean to be an image bearer of God? Well, uh, my uncle Logie was a very extraordinarily generous man. He liked to lavish gifts on people constantly and would always try and pay if he could and surprise you by, you know, how you found out he'd paid the bill already. Just incredibly generous man. My cousin Ian is just like him. He can't seem to stop just giving and giving at every opportunity. This is a picture of bearing someone's image. When I look at my cousin Ian, I remember my uncle, who sadly has passed away, but he bears his image. This is what it means for man and woman to bear God's image, that we are like God. When people look at us, they can see something of our Father. Now you might ask, okay, that sounds great. Men and women together are told that they equally bear God's image and then that they equally have dominion. They're given rulership, women together with the man, of stewardship of the world. They're given a job. And you might say, okay, but stop there. I know that it says that there's, a, there's a, a word for women that isn't given for men, and that woman is suitable helper. And you might think, all right, already, isn't there some kind of inherent sexism in that? I know when I first read it, that's certainly what I thought. When we think of the word helper with our cultural paradigms, we think of Santa's little helper, or we think of a lovely assistant on a game show who doesn't really, you know, she's the sidekick to the main show. Adam is the main show, Eve's just the sidekick, she doesn't have her own purpose. But this is to completely misunderstand and mistranslate the word helper. How do we know this? Well, this word, in every other instance in which it's used in the Old Testament, it's used of God. So in Deuteronomy 33 verse seven, it says this, it asks God to be Judah's help. In Exodus 18.4, it says that uh, God is my helper. And then in Psalm 33.20, uh, it says, we wait in hope for the Lord, for he is our help and shield. If anything, this is an implication of man needing help, and woman is <laughs> likened to God in this way. Now, am I saying that women are superior? I'd love to in some ways, but no. <laughs> the very next word tells us why this is not the case. Eze, that word helper, is there linked to connecto, which means suitable. Other translations are counterpart, alongside. It means they fit together. The picture is of a jigsaw puzzle. They go together. It's really beautiful. If you compare this, interestingly, with other ancient writers, so Hesiod, who was the great Greek cosmogonist, he talks about women, always from the beginning, as being kind of antagonistic towards men. They're constantly getting their sons to castrate their, their, their women's husbands. Um, when uh, Hesiod speaks about Pandora, the first woman, he ends the poem saying this, so women are a curse to mortal man. This is so different to the picture that we have in the Bible. When Adam, needing a wife, he's, he's needing um, a companion, sees Eve, he utters what is potentially the first love, um, love poem, even if it's a little bit, um, well, it's not that refined. He basically says, wow. <laughs> bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The, the, what we're seeing here is a picture of togetherness. It's really beautiful. But it's not just on the female issue, on racism as well. We see Adam and Eve, we're told, are the representatives all, with, all the way through the Bible of the entire human race. And again, if we compare this to ancient literature, it's very interesting. The ancient um, Egyptian mythologies paint Egypt as the, uh, alone, as the, the human uh, race, while every other race on earth is descended from God's enemies. This is not the picture we have in the Bible. In fact, in Genesis, all the way through, it's so interesting, what is um, constantly affirmed are the binaries, the contrasts, light and dark, land and sea, birds of the air, fish of the sea, big animals, small animals, male and female. The picture is that, and, and then we told this universe glorifies God. And what you have is this God who loves diversity. He loves this. And then Adam and Eve are told, go and multiply. And the picture is DNA, DNA multiplying, diversity increasing. And that this together brings glory to God. This is the picture of Genesis. It's so beautiful. Interestingly, Babel, this is why Babel was, was so abhorrent to God. What did they do? Again, after the fall, God had told them again, go and multiply. But what did they do? They huddled together, we're told. They didn't go off on that adventure God had called them to. They built a city and they, tried, they, they kept their language the same and they, it was all about homo homogeneity. And God was saying, no, I've called you to diversity, beautiful, celebrated diversity. So that's Genesis. Right at the end of time, when all things are restored, what is the picture of heaven? Well, John in Revelation 7, 9 says this, 
And after this, I looked up, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, peoples and languages, standing before the throne and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. This is the picture of heaven. It's glorious. I sometimes picture it like the Olympics, you know, each nation coming out, and we cheer as the Swedes do their thing, and then the Africans come and do their thing, and each, and you know, okay, obviously it descends into competition after that, so that's not like heaven, but there's a picture of each nation coming and bringing their praise to God. It's glorious. It's diversity at its best. When I was 11, and in... Um, just recently, post-apartheid South Africa gives away my age a little bit. Our church approached a group of black South Africans and said, please, would you help us? Would you come and join us? We need to, we need to somehow know what it is to be together, to be friends. We're, we're so sorry we haven't stood up against the evils of apartheid. We're so sorry. Please, would you come? Please, would you extend your forgiveness to us? And some of our um, white South African church went into the township area, and some of them very graciously came every Sunday to our church. And I remember, to be honest, when I was 11, I'm so ashamed of this, but I hated it. As a preteen, I didn't know how to understand these people who had grown up in a totally different environment to me. The language was different, the culture was different. And I really resented it. Do you know, years later, there came a point. There was a girl that I hadn't got on with very well, and I realized she was one of my best friends in the church. And slowly, over time, something had changed, and I loved singing in other languages. I loved hearing the stories of their culture. It was so rich, it was so beautiful. And when I finally moved to the UK a few years later, you know, nothing against the UK. <laughs> I love it, but they were, you know, I missed singing in other languages. I missed the cultural diversity. But what about, you might say, okay, maybe you might agree, okay, maybe God's ideal is this kind of diversity, this kind of equal valuing of men and women and people of all nations. But you might say, what about the details of the Bible? Aren't there moments in the Bible where women are subjugated or told to be subjugated? Aren't there moments in the Bible where God curses? I don't know if you've heard about the Hamitic myth, where God curses one group of people. Does that really happen? And as Simon mentioned, are there moments in the Bible where God commands a genocide, as all these atheists seem to mention? Surely that is the worst type of racism that we can imagine. I'm not going to touch on what Simon's already mentioned about Canaan, but I just want to say a couple of things about this. Firstly, the Canaanites were the most ethnically similar to the Israelite people. They even shared very similar languages. As Simon mentioned, God frequently used other nations to judge other peoples, including the people of Israel, Assyria and Babylon. So what we can see is this is not about ethnic uh, th this is not about ethnicity, this is about moral judgments. But then you might say, aha, but what about the fact that Israel, are, uh, we're told that they're the chosen people. I remember when I first read that, I thought, that's horrible. Why would he choose them? I, I feel excluded. But you know, if I were to come into the room today and I were to say to you, you've been chosen, what would you immediately say? What for? <laughs> and that's sometimes something we miss. In Genesis 12, we're told very explicitly that Abraham is chosen, what for? To be a blessing to all the nations, to all the families of the earth. They're chosen for a purpose. This is not, this is not favoritism, divine favoritism in any way. And I think one of the most beautiful pictures of this is it's Jonah. In the book of Jonah, we're told that Jonah is sent to the Ninevites. Now, the Ninevites were their racial enemies. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and they were constantly looting Israel. And Jonah runs away, even faces the, you know, the belly of a, of a whale, just so that he doesn't have to try and bring some kind of good, potentially hopeful message to these people that he hates. And at the end of the book of Jonah, we're seeing, it seems to be the whole point is that God is trying to teach Jonah a lesson. <laughs> I love Jonah's words. He says, he says, you know why I ran away, God, in Jonah chapter four, verse 20. He says, I know that you are a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and compassion. I knew that you would relent. <laughs> He's angry at God's compassion towards this other nation. And he says, and Jonah, God says to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? And Jonah says, 
I do do well to be angry. In fact, I want to die. This is the extent of his racist anger. And God gently says to him, the last lines of the book of Jonah are so beautiful. Jonah, should I not care for the 20,000 people in that city? It's not ethnic. But you know what? We're not just... We're not just told that this is something that God kind of sprinkles in throughout the, you know, um, the Bible and that just one day we just need to wait till heaven and then we'll finally be able to gather together. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came and he has destroyed the dividing wall, the hostility between races, between sexes, that if we are in Christ now, we're told in Galatians 3 that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. Is that our experience now? If you are a Christian and you're experiencing some sort of hostility, and this is a question for myself, have I entered into the kind of life that God has for me? You know, when we look at Jesus, I think the starkest thing about Jesus when you read the Gospels, especially if you read them not as a Christian, the starkest thing is the way he turns things upside down. He values the person who's oppressed. He will say, you know what, the society has degraded you. Society has says that you're too sinful. Do you know what? I'm telling you that you have value. I'm telling you that you are a child of God and you have inherent worth because of that. You know, women were sidelined. They were told they weren't really worthy of of being taught. What do we see? Jesus holding Mary up as an example when Martha says, you know, she should get back in the kitchen. Jesus says, no, she has chosen what is better. So if you ever wondered where that line, you know, um, the woman's place is in the kitchen, you can be sure it's not from the Bible. (laughs) Jesus says, no. But you know, some of his most amazing theological truths are said to people who are of low esteem, people that society has disregarded, to women, to Martha, to the woman at the well. You know, he says things like, I'm the resurrection and the life. I am he, I'm the Messiah. He elevates women. I love the fact that women are completely integral to the three biggest, most important moments in the New Testament, the incarnation. If you've ever wondered, is God some sort of macho, you know, man? He just hung out in the womb of a woman for nine months. It just doesn't add up. He could have come in any way, but he was happy to just submit that, submit himself to the care of a woman. Then at the cross, we're told the woman gathered around him. Dorothy L. Sayers says this, perhaps it is no wonder that the women were first at the cradle and last at the cross. They had never known a man like this. They had never been another. A prophet and a teacher who never treated them as the woman, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them. He took their questions and their arguments seriously. But this isn't just women. What we see in Jesus is a picture of how God values all people The Bible tells us if we want to know what God is like, we just have to look at Jesus. We're told in Colossians that he's the exact representation of the nature of God. I wonder where you are at today. Do you feel that you're in a place where you can celebrate diversity, whether that be in your marriage, with your children, in your church? Are you able to enter into that joy of seeing someone as different to you but recognizing that they are of inherent value to God and that their well-being is integrally tied up with yours. You know, um, Abraham Lincoln spoke very movingly in his second inaugural speech about the effects on America of the 250 years of the slave trade. He recognized that we are linked in with the way we treat other people. The Bible pictures us, humanity, as a body. If you are the nose, you know, you can't despise the eye. The eye needs the nose. We're very different. We do entirely different things, but we, we need each other. The Bible says we are one new man in Christ. And if today you have felt that you've been the subject of oppression, I just want to say to you that the God of the Bible is God who sees the One of the most beautiful pictures um, in the Bible is Hagar. You know, Abraham was a great father of the faith, and this woman, she had no power, she had no status. She was really easily used and abused, and she was by a great man of faith. 
And Abraham is, of course, a great man of faith. He's held up as one in the Bible. And yet, what do we see when he abuses and throws Hagar out? She's useless to him. She has no social power whatsoever. We see that God goes and esteems her. And do you know what she says? My eyes have seen the one who sees me. And I hope that as I've been speaking, you know, if you are one of those people who's been oppressed over time, your people have been oppressed, can I say that God sees you and he honors you? And if you are someone who's struggling with feelings that perhaps you've been involved in that, God invites you into an radical adventure of enjoying the diversity that he's created. Thank you so much for listening. We're gonna get into a time of questions. Great, thank you, Laura. Thank you for the questions that you've been voting on in Pigeonhole. Again, if you've been writing your questions down, can I ask the team now to just get the written questions from the floor as well and give them to the front and we'll try and feed any of them that come through as well. Um, Laura, you can see the screen, some of the questions. Why don't we just take that first mm -hmm. one to begin with. First Timothy 2.12 seems to prohibit women from teaching, at least in the context of a church. Mm -hmm. Laura, how would Thanks you for adding that little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to justify what you've just done. Yeah. Um, how should we correctly understand this passage? Can you take a few minutes, Laura, and just yeah. speak to us well, about Well, I would say that actually this was one of the hardest um, issues for me growing up. I remember when I was about 15, going into my room and just thinking, I can't deal with commentaries. I can't deal with other people. I closed the door and I just started to weep. And I said, God, what are you saying in this? Are you saying that women don't have the same abilities as men or that even if they do, they just need to suppress them? I was like, I need to know who you are. I need to know. And I, I can't go into the whole story of how God gently and so kindly dealt with me on those passages. But one thing that I would just start to say is I think sometimes when our hearts feel grieved about certain things, it's a good indication to get, go to God on that. If you know God already and something in the Bible just jolts with you, I think it's important to take that to God and say, teach me, Lord, what am I missing here? Who are you? On this particular passage, there are multiple interpretations. They fall into two major categories, people who believe that this is, um, this is relevant for all people across all cultures, and other people who say, actually, we feel like this is one of those texts of which there are many in the Bible, which is, cu which is culturally context-specific. I have come to feel that that is actually the best interpretation of that text. We know that it's written to the church in Ephesus. At the time, um, Ephesus was completely riddled with what we call the Diana cult, or um, that's the, the Roman version of, um, of this cult, which really, the goddess Artemis in the Greek, she was a woman, again, who, uh, the, the picture of her was one of castrating men. She was that goddess that was raging through and hating on men. And that was part of the culture, we know that. And it, might, it seems to make a lot of sense that maybe some of the women, as they've been joining the church and becoming part of this, they were bringing some of that cultural context in. What we, can also, what we also know about women, for example, in that time is that they wouldn't have been speaking the lingua franca. Women were speaking little dialects, not the, not the language of the economy. And that's where the language would have been being preached. So what seems to be happening is that Paul is saying, look, there's a group of women who are obviously becoming increasingly loud and potentially disruptive. And he's saying, actually, um, let them, let them hear those who have authority on this and also let them be quiet uh, here in Corinthians because they need to be able to hear what is, is being preached. And that seems to me actually to make the most sense of what the rest of the New Testament teaches. For example, when Corinthians says that women must be silent, it then straight away goes on to talk about how they're meant to prophesy in what manner. So, that, you know, people sometimes see, say we need to take the plain reading of the text, and I, I sometimes think that's maybe actually not good theology because there is always a context. And we see in the New Testament, incredibly, Phoebe is called a deacon. This is the same title that is given to Timothy and to Paul. There's a lot more I could say. If this is a question for you, please do come and, and speak to me about it. There's so much more to say, but I, I have felt actually really convinced that that isn't a, a good interpretation of that text. Um, the other thing would be to say that prophecy is often a way of teaching in the Bible, that Mary's prophetic message at the beginning of Luke is incredibly, you know, teaches us all about social action. So it's quite hard to start to distinguish, to say, you know, you can prophesy, but you can't teach. You know, well, let's make sure I don't say anything vaguely teach that could be teach-worthy. It's just a couple of questions to consider. <laughs> 
Um, Laura, can I get a second question again on the theme of women, and then I'll take a third question that's more to do with race that's come up. But there's a second question that talks about what you mentioned about being made in the image of God. And you talked about men and women being equally made in the image of God. And this question, I guess, is just wanting to revisit that a little bit. Are women created in the image of God, and are they equal? And can you just expand a little bit on what you mean by those themes? Yeah, sure. So, well, I think this is actually one of the most important questions because Genesis is very clear that women are made in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. And so whatever 1 Corinthians 11 is saying, it seems to be talking about the relationship between man and woman and the fact that, so I decided not to talk about it in my talk, but the fact that man was created first and then woman out of, of man being um, an important aspect of, you know, of also of our differences and the, the, way, the way we're created. I think it's an, it's a, it basically, theologically, you, beca- you can become very tied up if you start to say that that actually means that women aren't resembling God. Jesus just doesn't um, affirm that at all. In fact, as I said, he's constantly elevating women and seeming to say to the men, you have misunderstood this. So, uh, perhaps rather than going into the theology, you can come and speak to me afterwards. I think there are maybe questions um, about, about the order of creation in that. Um, sometimes people have said, well, does Adam being first somehow mean that he's superior? Again, I don't think that seems to make sense. You know, the animals were made before Adam. Are they superior to him? Um, in fact, what we seem to see is an increasingly... No comment on that. <laughs> The design seems to be increasingly intelligent and intricate. So, no, I'm sorry. Oh, the joys of what you can say <laughs> when you have the microphone. Let me move, let me move this. Um, maybe I'll ask, it wasn't the next uh, question in terms of how many votes it got, but I'm aware that there were a lot of questions on gender and not that many about race. And I'd love to just pick up one final question that is to do with race. And the question said, are Christians still fundamentally racist by having predominantly black, white, or Asian churches? And I wondered, Laura, from your own background and history, whether you could talk a little bit maybe to the expression of what it looks like to be truly multicultural in, in the way that we do church. Yeah, I, I think it's very easy for us to say, I'm not racist. You know, I value people who are different and then only surround ourselves with people who are the same as us. That's a very easy way to, to say we are not racist, but actually never have that challenged. I guess I would point back to that, my own experience of it actually being, I, you know, at 11, I was against apartheid. I'd been taught against it. I would never have said I agreed with it, but the reality of actually trying to integrate was painful. Especially if you are of the group that has been the oppressor. There's a lot of feelings of guilt and defensiveness around that. And I really think that actually God is calling us to go through the pain of that. You know, I'm not married, but I believe that that is a difficult process as well when you're married. The differences cause tension and you have to push through in order to value the other. But I think that's such a beautiful process. And so I would say that I would actually say that I think this is one of the areas the church needs to hear God's prophetic vision. If heaven, we're going to be worshiping together. If that is God's picture, then we know that for the church now, that is actually meant to be his picture. And, and so I would say we need to be active about that. Um, it's easy to be passive, but we need to, yeah, I would say take that seriously. Thank you so much, Thank Laura. You. Please join me in thanking Laura for her session.